All right, Psalm 12. Very famous psalm. Of course, is one that I have even highlighted in my Bible because of the, the end there, verses 6 and 7, shows that the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Uh, I would recommend, if you, if you make markings in your Bible, to highlight that verse, make a notation, or write a note somewhere. When, uh, when you're discussing with somebody about why you believe, you know, why are we King James only? Why is that the Bible we use? Very good reference to point out to somebody that God is the one who has promised to preserve His Word. That's what the Bible says. He's preserving it. You know, if it was just left up to men, yeah, there would be mistakes. And the argument makes sense under a normal, just human work of, of translation and things like that. That argument makes sense to say, well, they're going to make mistakes. There's going to be some errors. There's going to be some problems in translation. Except when God does the preserving. Amen. And that's, that's the whole point. And that's, you know, and that's why I believe doctrinally that the Bible does teach. And we find verses like this that explain that. Look, God's preserving it. If God's the one preserving it, just as much as He was the one speaking when people wrote down the words, when Moses was used, when David was used, when Solomon was used, when all these various men of God were used to reveal the Word of God unto us, when the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, those were God's words. And I believe that God is also in charge of preserving him. But again, I don't want to get too far into that because that's not what the sermon's about at all. But we're reading this chapter and I want to just make that point out so you could make a note of it and, and use that, write it in your Bible somewhere to uh, whenever there's that, that issue comes up. We're going to reread this. It's a real short psalm. Psalm number tw 12, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail." From among the children of men. This is a psalm begging God, God help. The godly men, they're disappearing. The faithful man is gone. I feel like this is a time that we're living in today. There's a lot of people where the God, like, where are the godly people? Where are the godly Christians? Where are the faithful men? They're failing from among the children of men. The, the, the morality is, is decaying rapidly. Where are the people who are godly? Where are the people who are just going to stand up for the Lord? Where are they? Help, God. We need help. We need more people. But I want to point this out. He's, he's stating the godly man ceases. The faithful fail from among the children of men. And then he goes in the very next book at verse number two. They speak. They speak vanity. Why is the faithful failing? It's in their words. It's in their communication. Nobody is standing up and saying what's right. The reason why the faithful is failing, it says, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. And the subject matter we're going to be talking about tonight has to do with our mouth. It has to do with the words that are spoken. The words that are spoken, this is probably one of the most powerful things, one of the most important things in our lives in general is just our, what, what, the things that we say. Amen. Words are definitely more powerful than brute force. We know that, that God, by His Word, created everything that we see today. He created the heavens and the earth. God spake everything into existence. I mean, the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light. In, in speech, it's not just with God. The things that we say, and we've been going through the book of Proverbs, and we've been studying how important it is to keep check on the things that we say and, and how we use our mouth and how powerful those things are. We just did that this last Wednesday. And there's a topic, and we're gonna, I'll get there in just a minute, that I have been covering, but I don't feel like I've done a good enough job of really kind of just going in depth and making, making a point of this one specific issue that has to do with the, with, the, with the words that we use and the things that we speak. But I'm going to keep going through Psalm 12 before I get to that. So he says, The faithful man sees it. The godly man's gone. They speak vanity, everyone of his neighbor. Verse 3, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. 
who is Lord over us. Again, this is all has to do with the words. This all has to do with what is being said, what is being spoken. Verse 5, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puppeth at him. And then he goes into God's word. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver try in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. The wicked are speaking their nonsense. They're always trying to push their agenda, and they're mainly doing it through words. And you notice that there's, you know, the, the words are being pumped into you. There, there's an agenda, and it's, I don't want to really get off into this too much, going on in the mainstream media and there's, there's evil forces that at, at work behind the scenes and ultimately it boils down to Satan but there's a narrative being pushed that even when you're aware of it you have to be careful not to succumb to it and not to just let yourself get involved in, in the conversation that is being presented okay and, and what I mean by that is every issue that comes up today the media, doesn't matter what channel you go to, the talking points are all the same. Has anyone ever noticed that? Yeah. Like, it's always these same few things, and sometimes those talking points isn't even a major concern. I mean, the, the, you know, the, whatever is the news is being presented to you, and basically it just kind of steers people into, well, you either agree with this or you agree with this, and it's just like, those are your two options. And it's like, well, what about you know, thinking about it completely different. What about a biblical perspective? What about anything else? It, none of that is ever brought up. And, and you're kind of left with these, these couple of choices and that's what everyone ends up talking about too. And see, when you're following the news too much, you could end up getting caught up in just this whole way of thinking and just thinking about all these issues, many of which don't even matter. Many of them are just distractions. See, the, the media likes to, to present non-issues that, that get people riled up when there's something else really important going on in the world. You know, when there's wars happening, when there's things that is like, oh yeah, don't, don't worry about what's going on over here. Worry about what Target's doing with their restrooms, right. right? Which in itself is wicked, I know, look, I get it. But like, <laughs> the fact that people are even talking about that, it's like, what? Why are we talking about that? It, it, but it's, it's a, it's a sidetracking from, from a lot of things that are going on. But I, I digress. I don't want to get into that very much right now because that, that is not what the sermon's about. Our lives, and let's just, let's just bring it back. We're in a fundamental Baptist church. Fundamental, okay? We believe in the fundamentals of the Bible. We believe this Bible literally. We, we read and the Bible says what it says and we believe what it says, Okay? We need to get back to being a people and having a culture that is an old-fashioned culture where people can say things and you're not going to be looked on as, well, maybe, maybe he'll do it, maybe he won't. You know, people were, you know, men were, used to be men of their words. Nowadays, lying and, and just becoming flaky and not being faithful is just a normal way of life. It's like, I mean, that's the way it is on the job for me. There's people that I work with, and it's like, I have to just be following up on every single little thing because I can't give people work to do and rely on them to be faithful. And it's just, and it's a younger generation, and it seems to be the way it's going with everybody. And lies are becoming not that big of a deal. Just, oh yeah, so-and-so told me this. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. I would hate for someone to think that about the things that I say. You know, your character, the integrity that you have, it means a lot. I mean, what else do you really have? Your words should be very important and you should treat them importantly. Amen. When someone is going to put confidence in you, we ought to be able to, to live up to that and not let people down. Our lives should be based on principles. We ought to have biblical principles that dictate our actions, that dictate what are we going to do, what are we not going to do. We don't want to be hypocrites, for example. We don't want to be saying, oh yeah, I believe this, and then just doing the exact opposite. We need to be living the example of the principles that we believe in. You think about our salvation. Our salvation rests in hope of a promise. 
And we alluded to this this morning. We we're kind of talking about salvation a lot this morning. But our fate relies on the integrity of God's word. I mean, think about that. You and I are staking our fate, our souls, in words that were given to us that we believe are from God. God's word. And the integrity, knowing that this is God's word, that God's going to keep his word. Now, I, I mean, I wholeheartedly believe we have a God that keeps his word, right? But that is how important that his integrity is that when he says something, that it's true. I mean, my soul is dependent on it. My soul is dependent that when the Bible says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, that God keeps his promises. All of my faith is in that. My whole soul is, I, I've just gone, it was on God's word. That's on that promise that God made. That's where, that's where my bed is, right? The integrity that he has, it's everything. Now, again, that's God. But if we are going to live godly in this present world, we ought to be able to have a similar character to where when we say something, it can be known that we're going to follow through with it. We're going to do it. We're not going to back out. We're not going to just say, well, whatever. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. God is faithful. But we can hold fast without any waver. We don't have to doubt when God speaks. We need to be more like that. The importance of being able to trust in God's word cannot be understated. If we are to be followers of Christ, we ought to be true to our word also. Turn, if you would, to uh, Proverbs. We're going to go through some of these Proverbs that we've already gone through in the past weeks. Proverbs 25. I'm going to kind of put them all together because I don't think I've done this as we've been covering this specific topic on speaking with mouth. And we've gone into a lot of different things, but tonight what I'm going to be focusing in on is the tailbearer. The tailbearer. People who speak things that they shouldn't be speaking. People who reveal secrets. People who are not found to be faithful. People who are speaking when, they're, when, when they ought not to be. And, and, and saying things that they ought not. And, and um, this is just one aspect. Obviously, there's many aspects of how important our words are in our life and being able to be trusted with our words. This is one small aspect. But I don't think I've really gone into this one aspect very much, which is one of the reasons why we're doing this tonight. Everyone needs, first of all, friends that they can rely on. We need that. We need the fellowship. We need, we need people that we can trust in our life. It's important. I, I believe it's very important to have friends. It's important to have family. It's also important to have friends. And our friends ought to be brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to be friends with people in the church. You know, friends with, with other believers. Those are the best friends to have. Amen. We need to be able to rely on people. We need faithful friends. People who are dependent. That's I mean, what faithful means. It's dependable. There's two meanings for faithful. Full of faith or dependable. We need friends that are dependable. That we could rely on. That we can... Go to for counsel, for advice. When we, when we want to seek, hey, what do you think about this? I've got this question. I've got this issue. I've got this problem at home. I'm having some difficulties. I could use some advice. The Bible says that it's great to have a multitude of counselors, but I'll tell you what, when people are going through some real personal issues, you want to be able to, to rely on people that you could trust. One, to give you good advice, but two, not to go blab in their mouth to everybody else what problems you have going on in your life. Now, I know we live in a society today where everything is just being thrown out in the open. And it's a disgrace. It really is. We live in a social media age these days where people are just sharing everything up on Facebook. It's disgusting. I mean, it really is one of the, I don't like going on Facebook at all. I don't really see it that much anymore, but I would go on sometimes and see like husbands and wives arguing on Facebook, like in front of everybody for the whole world to see and saying things that's like, you shouldn't be saying this out in public, let alone on the internet. This is something that's dealt in the, in the privacy of your own house. There are things, and I don't care what this government's going to tell you. Well, if you got nothing to hide, look, privacy is important. There are things that we need to keep 
private. And there are things that you want to keep private. There are issues that people deal with that you want to be able to get some good advice on and expect and rely on a faithful friend not to say anything. And if you're going to be that faithful friend, you need to make sure, make sure, no matter how juicy the content is, that you're keeping your mouth shut. Because once you break that trust, once you, once you break that, that, that trust that's been given to you, it's hard to regain that. It's hard for people then to go and trust you again when your confidence is broken in a person. Look at Proverbs 25, verse 19. Proverbs 25, 19. Just a, just a, I want to underscore the importance of being faithful and being a faithful friend. Verse 19 reads, Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. I mean, it's horrible. No one wants a broken tooth and no one wants a foot out of joint. It would cause you a lot of pain. And putting your confidence in an unfaithful man, someone who's not going to be reliable, not going to be dependable, not there for you, in the way that you need them there for you, is, does damage, it does hurt to, the other, to that person. Flip back to Proverbs 11. That's the unfaithful man. We want to be faithful. We don't want to be unfaithful. We don't want to be unfaithful, especially in the time of trouble. I mean, if you care about your friends and love them, you want to be faithful. You want to be dependable for that person. You want to be there for them. Proverbs 11, verse 13, the Bible reads, A talebearer revealeth secrets. And this is contrasted with, But he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. The talebearer, and look, I don't think, does anyone want to be known as a talebearer? I don't think, I mean, it's a bad, that's a bad name to have and be given to you as a person to be, yeah, I'm a talebearer. I reveal secrets. Don't tell me anything because I'm a talebearer. I'm going to go and tell other people. The whole point of having a close friend and getting counsel people so that they can be able to keep their mouth shut. But he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. And again, I know there's an influence. I know there's, we live in a society where people are just going nuts with the things that they share online. Don't let that influence you or impact you. And oftentimes, and this is, you know, unfortunately, events will happen because almost just, just not intentionally. Because people are in a habit of, of saying things and confiding in other people. But let me tell you this, when, when someone has confidence in you, you have confidence among other people with your issues, but if someone has confidence in you, you don't share that with the person that you confide in. That is between the two of you. That is between, you know, you know and obviously we're talking about things where it's apparent or explicitly said that this is private. This is not to be talked about. You don't want to be known as a talebearer. In Proverbs 20, 19, it says, He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets, therefore meddle not with him that fly with his lips. Again, the same thing. A talebearer being told as someone who reveals secrets. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 18, 8. Because here's the, the, the problem is, even if you're unintentional in revealing something to people who are not supposed to know whatever the matter is even if it's unintentional not now you know when if they find out you're going to be known as someone who can't keep a secret and that's damaging because you don't want to damage you know first of all your 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 friendship you want to be able to provide godly counsel i'm sure everyone has friends cares about your friends and you want to be there to be able to be used of them in their time of need the same way that you would use them in your time of need but when you're not able to be faithful, you're no longer going to be looked on as someone that, you can, that can be trusted. And not only that, when what happens then with the tail bear, when someone's going around and just spreading information, is that that could then end up coming back and damaging the person who wanted their privacy. Because now all of a sudden, you tell someone else and they don't realize how private it's supposed to be, then they go and tell someone else, and then all of a sudden you get all these, you know, this going on and on and on. It happens more often than you think, and, it, and, it's, and it's not right. Proverbs, uh, where, did I have you turn to Proverbs 18? Proverbs 18, 8, the words of a talebearer are as wounds. It's hurtful. 
You destroy the trust, and, and sometimes the things that you're revealing can come back and do damage on the people, and there's a reason why they wanted it in private to begin with. And they go down to the innermost parts of the belly. The same exact phrase is found again in Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26, 20 reads, Where no wood is, there the, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a tail bearer are as wounds. And they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. It's repeated. The exact same word-for-word -word phrase is found in Proverbs twice about the words of a tail bearer being as wounds. Turn if you would to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. The issue of trust and having, being faithful and having people confide in you is a principle that you ought to have where you can say, I am going to be like this. I am going to make sure and, 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 and to not divulge anything um, unless, it's, unless it's okay with the other person. And even in the small matters, you might not think something's a very big deal. You might think, well, it's not that big of a per deal if this person knows. But it doesn't matter what you think when someone confides in you. It really doesn't. If they, if they are treating you with confidence, then you have to not say anything. It's a very important issue. Luke 16, look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And you have, if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? We need to be faithful even in the smallest of matters, even in the things that you don't think is that big of a deal. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. And I will do this, and, and, and you know, again, you have to have discretion with certain things. If you give me your phone number, I'm not just going to give your number out to everyone that asks for it, okay? And you could trust me with that. And, I'll, and, and, and there, there's probably people in here where I've asked, hey, can I give so-and-so your phone number? And you say, that's not that big of a deal. You're right. I don't think that is that big of a deal to give someone your phone number. I mean, ultimately speaking, is it some huge thing? No. But what it is, is it's working on a principle. And... If you could be found faithful in that which is least, if someone could say, wow, here's someone who, who actually you know, treats my privacy well and will be faithful in the small things, I know I could trust them in something that's bigger than that. And again, you know, I mean, discretion, I've given out phone numbers in the past where someone is in need and someone is able to help that person and I know that this person would really like to get in contact with them, you know, whatever. Obviously, there's some discretion there. But um, it's just the point that we need to be faithful in all areas, the small things as well as the big things. We need to be able to prove ourselves that we, that we can be trustworthy. Why? Because you want, we have an important message to preach. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are supposed to be trustworthy. As a Christian, just, just have, have, claiming the name of Christ and saying, He's my Savior and I believe in Him and I'm trying to live my life according to God's Word. If you can't be trusted, if, you, you know, if, you, if you're living a life where, where no one's able to trust you, you know, that's, a, that's a smear, that's a bad mark going then back, back on Christ. <clears throat> if someone commits a secret to your trust and then you go and tell someone else, it doesn't matter if the secret was no big deal to you or to the person um, you told it, even if the person you told to is capable of keeping a secret. It already demonstrates that you're not able to be faithful and control your own mouth if you're going to do that. Um, trust is given. When that trust is breached, it's hard to regain that trust again. Our words matter. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 1. It's a shorter sermon tonight. It's a real brief, you know, it's a, it's a real simple point, but I just want to make sure we get this home that um, the type of people and the type of principles that we should have because our words do matter. Very important. If you're given knowledge of something personal by someone and told it to be kept private, you have absolutely no regard for that person and you become a liar when you go and tell someone else anyways, when you just go and share that information. 
and I don't I think it's just the way that God made us this tends to be more of a problem among women than among men there's just the you know the the Bible talks about the widows and, and having them remarry so that they're not become tattlers and going around from house to house and getting and being busybodies and getting involved in everybody else's business. It's just one of the natural things that, that women are more social and talkative and, and, and kind of concerned in other issues and men are just kind of a little bit more whatever. <laughs> they could seem not caring as much. But um, so women, you know, pay attention to, this is definitely, um, it's probably more of a struggle than it is with men. But all of us, I mean, it's still the same standard applies. It's the same principle. <clears throat> We're in Mark chapter 1. I just want to show you one example from the Bible here where Jesus told someone to keep his mouth shut, and then what happened as a result. Mark chapter 1, verse 38, And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. Jesus is going about his work, his ministry, saying, Let's go to these other towns. That's why I'm here. I need to go and preach to these other towns. Look at verse 39, And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion. He didn't have to do this. He moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will. Be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And look at verse 43. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. There is no doubt about what Jesus commanded him. Jesus straightly said, he straightly said, don't tell anybody. Go to the priest, you know, deal with the priest and do everything that's supposed to be done for your cleansing according to the law. But don't go, you know, telling everybody about this. Jesus had his reasons for this, and I think the reasons are, are found out then in verse 45. Let's read to verse 45. But he went out. So he didn't listen to what Jesus told him. Jesus just healed him, but he couldn't keep it to himself. Now, obviously, you could look at this and say, well, I understand that. He's really happy. He's full of joy that this happened. I could get that. But the thing is, Jesus told him not to say anything. He went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter. And that word blaze is important. And we're going to get to that when we turn to James 3. It's going to be the next place we turn. Insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Jesus' job was to go into the towns and to preach in all the towns. This guy made it so that he couldn't go into the city. Wasn't able to go in anymore. He couldn't do his work. He couldn't do his work effectively at all. He had to go now outside the city and they all had to come to him. What does that mean now for the people that maybe weren't able to make it out to Jesus? That he would have been able to minister to had he been able to go into the city. Now they're left out in the cold as a result of this guy who, hey, I mean, he was happy, right? He was excited. And he should be happy and excited. But when Jesus straightly charged him, it was for a reason say, well, how could that be wrong? He's glorifying God and giving Jesus all this credit. How could it be wrong? It could be wrong when Jesus said, don't do it. That's when it's wrong. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? God says not to do something, you don't do it. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. You, you need to listen to obey. And, and see, this is one of those situations where you might not even understand why it's important to keep the confidence that's given to you when someone says, hey, you know, keep this a secret. But it could be very important. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 3. We're almost done. Like I said, this is a shorter sermon. <clears throat> James chapter 3, verse number 5. The Bible reads, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. 
And again, it's relating your tongue to being a flame, to being a fire, to be able to, to, to blaze abroad these matters, to get it, you know, all it takes is that little spark. You know, someone revealing a secret to one other person is enough to start a blaze. Because then that person tells another person, that person tells another person, before you know it, everybody's talking about it. You don't have to turn there, but in Proverbs 16, 28, the Bible says, A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. This can cause, cause, cost you friendships over issues like this. When, when trust is betrayed, it, it could be a big thing to overcome. When, when you fail your faithfulness in, with, with somebody else. So this is something that you need to keep in mind, especially when you, if you find yourself in a position Someone tells you something and you're going to be, and, and they tell you, you know, this is a secret. The next time you have that urge to let other people in on that secret, you better think about your friend and say, how important is this person to me? Is it worth losing my friendship over? Because what ends up happening is that word gets out. You might think, well, they're not going to say anything. It's just going to be our, my little secret with this other person. That's actually usually not the way it works. You say, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Is it worth the gamble to you? I mean, think about your friend. Is it worth a gamble? If it is, you don't really care that much about your friend. And what, what can really be that juicy that you just have to, you have to tell it to other people? We need to have discretion. We need to know when it's right and when it's wrong. And, um, you know... Keep this in mind also when you want to give counsel to someone else. If something truly is a secret, don't assume that, they, that the other person knows and, or will figure that it's a secret. Be explicit with it. So you could let them know, hey, I don't want anyone else to know about this. We, this is something that we should all take to heart because if there's something that you really want to keep private, make it known. That way there's no miscommunication and misunderstanding when, oh, well, I thought I could tell this person and this person. I didn't, you know, no. And that way, the you know, matters that you think are very personal to yourself will, will stay private and will stay that way and um, will not come back and, and you know, harm one way or another. I'm going to close on this. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 27, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. What you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Anything we learn, anything that Jesus tells us, he says, blaze it abroad, right? Spread, that, spread it far and wide. The stuff that we learn, the stuff that he tells us, the things that we read, you know, and that is our job is to go out and preach and just reveal all of these secrets, all of the mysteries, everything that we know in the Bible. Let's reveal that. God's not trying to keep secrets from us, but we need to make sure that we can be faithful with other people when they um, put confidence in us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much um, for our friends here. I thank you for such a great church, dear Lord. I thank you that we have people here that could be relied upon to, uh, to, to put their trust in and uh, that we're here to help each other. We're here for fellowship. We're here to be able to support one another in, in our times of need, dear God. And I pray that you please strengthen us, strengthen our friendships, help us to, to be... Um, to, be, to make more friends with other like-minded believers here and, um, and just help us to, to be there and be a good friend for, for others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.